Where does myth and history meet? Dr. John Knight Lunwall and I have a really good conversation talking about history and mythology. And he takes us through a PowerPoint presentation showing a lot of interesting things. Many archeologists and historians thought a lot of characters never existed. Sometimes places never existed. And upon further investigation, we found some roots to some of these things that give us reason to believe there was a historical beginning or a root to the stories that we're reading today. Yeah, it may be completely mythologized, but does that mean that there was no history to it or a person at the basis? I don't know, let me know what you guys think. Hope you enjoy the show. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button and the bell, and don't forget, comment down below and let us know what you think. If you wanna join Myth Vision Podcast, you can go to our Patreon account and join us there as well. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We have my brother, John Knight Lunwall, Dr. John Knight Lunwall. How you doing? Doing great, Derek. It's good to see you again. You too. I, I want our audience who hasn't seen the previous episodes that we've done together and the one that went missing. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> well, that's, that's quite okay. It, it's uh, it, it gives it more authenticity when you bury some stuff for a thousand years or so. <laughs> oh, look, I, ladies and gentlemen, this is an inside joke. So, anyways, um, what is your expertise, if you don't mind? Yeah, I have a doctorate in comparative myth and religious studies from Pacifica Graduate Institute out of California. So, you know, my dissertation was on. Um, uh, the mystery cults of the Greco-Roman world. Um, but really, it was a, an exploration of how uh, cultic systems emerge out of oral societies from which we get the myths, the mythology. So uh, my, my uh, area of study is in oral societies and how they uh, transmit their information. And of course, uh, mythologies part of that. I mean, it, you know, when you, when you, when you do a graduate study, Derek, it, you're, <laughs> you, 90% of what you read is what academics think, right? You know, you, you should be reading source materials and, and, you know, all, all and you do, but uh, you, you are reading a, a lot of what academics think about what ancient mythology and history and, you know, is and how ancient religions emerged. Um, my uh, innovative take is I, I took all that I read out of years of graduate school and realized that they were missing two huge chunks <laughs> and all of them, all of them. And so uh, part of that is orality studies. It, it's shocking that you would miss that in theories of myth. Uh, and so, and then the other part was oral cosmology. Uh, so. You know, I'm a project leader of an archaeoastronomy project in Utah. We, I, I have a team of researchers, and we um, are looking at the Fremont Indian, that's the Native Americans um, that inhabited uh, present-day Utah, you know, a thousand years ago. We don't know, we, we know almost nothing about them, uh, but they did leave behind some, you know, artifacts, archaeological artifacts, and a whole ton of rock art. And I have shown on several different panels that the rock art has been carved in alignment with the sun as it moves across the sky through the year. Um, and so there's a whole methodology behind some of this rock art as they analogize it to the seasons and to the sun. Um, they probably analogized it to other things, the moon, certain stars, but that that would be very difficult to prove um, without more context. So, so this is what I do. I, I, I do, uh, you know, I lecture and I give presentations. I'm an editor and I do this archaeoastronomy project and I hang out with my buddy Derek every once right? in a while. <laughs> no, you, you bring up something interesting. We've done previous shows. For those of you who are watching, go down in the, in the uh, description. When this video is done, um, 
we did our previous video. You can see where he talks about the orality and the importance of that. We're going to be touching. I can guarantee you, you can't have John on the show and him not discuss <laughs> this because it's fascinating. You know, you talk about the, the idea of astrological stuff, okay? Then you talk about orality and how we went from a non-written type of people to writing. And I feel like the reason why people can see astro theology or people call it star myth stuff is because they are taking oral traditions or like you also em emphasized, it's not just oral. A lot of this is also dance and ritual movement, kind of like the Indian who's chanting across the fire at night. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing. There's significance to that, but they're writing a lot of this stuff down. And we see, like you said, there's not enough to, boom, we hit the nail. Here's the case we prove with all absolutes. But I see hints of it. I see like there's, there's definitely something there. And I think that goes into all of them. The Greek myths, you know, the, obviously Greco-Roman, uh, the Egyptian, the, you know, you got to kind of, in my opinion, I could be wrong, John, correct me if I'm wrong. But I think there's three pyramids that line up that look quite like Orion's belt. And I mean, there's people who actually deny that. So I don't know where we're going tonight. I'm just here to follow you. <laughs> I'm your student and hey, I want everyone watching. We've got, we've got some fun tonight. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about the intersections between ancient myth and history. Uh, and so how uh, oral, ancient oral societies, did, were they concerned about history? You know, as, and, and what is history to an oral society? And how they encoded that in myth and what kind of history you get out of oral societies. And it turns out, once you lay that groundwork, we're gonna, you know, rabbit trail into the Bible, as you would say, uh, very often. But as you understand how ancient oral societies transmitted their information, um, many of the stories in the Bible, it, you start seeing it in a new way. And so, um, so, but, you know, I, I've noticed on your show, you've got a, a lot of mythicists, a lot of people who are, are saying this can't be historical because it's mythological. And it turns out the issues are far more complex. Uh, and so uh, I think we're going to have fun. We'll have fun and we'll uh, tiptoe through the uh, oral tulips and we'll see where we get. <laughs> two, two things, ladies and gentlemen, you know, if you're going to be initiates to this, you've got to have thick skin and be willing to travel. I like to be, uh, I guess you'd say like water, Bruce Lee's little saying, be like water, you know? And so I try to travel wherever my guests go and allow them to give what they have to offer. I'm here to learn. I'm a student. I don't have all the answers. You know, that's why you don't see me just put out videos with Derek Lambert teaching. I always bring people on. I love learning and I hope my audience feels the same way because I'm on a quest for trying to find the concrete. Look, I see enough myth to know it's there. Anyone who has eyes that aren't, I like to call it Kool-Aid drinking red, they're not uh, told what to think that it's saying, can see the mythology, but can you find the history? And I think once you know the mythology is there, it's very complicated to know where does theology cut off? And where does history begin? And that's a very, even today, we all wrestle with that. You know, even you probably wrestle with that, but still you believe it's there. And I'm here on this journey and I'll shut up now. We can get on with the show, brother. <laughs> all right, Derek. You know, I, I just, I, I totally agree. Um, sometimes extracting, I am going to uh, start my PowerPoint. If, uh, let's see, now how do I share the screen? He can write books, but he cannot, I'm just, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, let's see. All right. Looks good. You got it? I got it. All right. Uh, look, you know, a long time ago, uh, Merche Eliade, who is a, um, a great scholar in the history of religions, uh, said, clearly, we do not doubt the historicity of characters in epic poetry. But their history uh, soon doesn't long resist the process of mythicization. That's his word. And so, in other words, there's all kinds of historical content in the, the, the poems of Homer, for example. And yet, by the time it gets to us, it's been mythologized. 
And so, you know, you said how, you can see where the myths are, but sometimes it's very hard to pull the history out of it. That is very true because it, it's easy to throw the needle into the haystack, but sometimes getting the needle back out of the haystack is impossible. And so, and, and, and that's a problem. And that's a problem we're going to face. Hey, so I'm going to start. Here we have a myth in history, the oral world and the written word. If, if you've seen my presentations, I always PowerPoint them. And I thought tonight we'd just jump right in. Um, uh, so I am going to take you to Egypt. Uh, I was there last year. All these shots are mine. This is a Luxor, the Temple of Karnak, and it's the, uh, you know, the pylon gate entering the temple. Um, and I really want to get some shots of it. Uh, the wall that you see there is actually completely carved with images and hieroglyphs. So here's a, a closer up shot. And now you can see uh, behind the statue that the wall is entirely covered with writing and images. It's actually very hard to see. You're there during the day. It's, uh, it's almost invisible because the sun blanches it out. Um, and so luckily, I, I went there a couple of times and I, I got there in the uh, early evening and, and I was there for hours in the night and they have light shining up and I did all these camera tricks to try to draw out the images that, that I could. Um, so here's just a close up. You can see that the walls are carved. Um, so let me tell you what's on this temple because it's going to uh, <clears throat> lead us into our conversation tonight. Uh, this is another image, by the way, not at uh, Karnak, but uh, uh, Abu Simbel that I took. And it's Ramses riding as a chariot during the Battle of Kadesh. And um, it turns out uh, the, uh, what we're looking at here at the Temple of Karnak is an entire scene of Ramses II fighting the Hittites in the Battle of Kadesh. That is what they've carved on this pylon gate. So here's what we know about that battle. Let me get back to my screen. One, it was an actual battle that took place in history. In fact, it's probably the best historically recorded battle we've got. Uh, there's references it, uh, to it throughout Egyptian writing and, uh, and in the Near East. And so we know it happened. It happened around 1274 BCE. It was the Egyptians versus the Hittites. It was a massive chariot warfare. They estimate, you know, if the texts are to be believed, between five and 6,000 chariots were involved from both sides. And... Um, it was fought near the city of Kadesh. This is northern Levant. Um, and Ramses II led his, his forces into battle. Uh, what we know historically about it is um, it doesn't, you know, it appears to have been a draw. There, there wasn't a, a decisive, the Egyptians taken over the Levant after the battle. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was a tactical victory for the Egyptians. And uh, what we get on the riding of the gate that, that we saw there at the Temple of Karnak is uh, a really interesting narrative. So let's get to that. So because here we have a drawing of the figures on that pylon gate. So a black and white drawing. And I've repeated it because on, on the left portion of the gate, you see Ramses here. Can you see my uh, cursor? Yeah. You see Ramses here sitting on his throne and here he is in his chariot, and he's leading his, uh, you know, chariot battalion into battle against the Hittites. Well, um, right behind him in that same scene is Ramses again, except he's twice as big, and he's facing the other direction. He's got these priests, you know, giving oblations and, and, and blessings. And so we have Ramses facing one direction as he charges into battle. We have Ramses twice the size facing the other direction, uh, you know, presumably receiving uh, prayers and, and gifts to, to get ready to win, to win the battle. And he goes into battle. Well, it turns out the text on the wall shows us that uh, the battle doesn't go well for Ramses. Um, according to what is written on the wall, Ramses charges in and uh, as, as the sun sets and darkness falls, and his chariots are scattered. And he finds himself 
all alone, surrounded by the entire horde of his enemy, right? And so he gets on his knees and he prays to Ammon uh, for aid to overcome his, his adversaries. And then at the darkest hour of the night, the seventh hour of the night, um, Ammon re, uh, responds to his prayer. He's given power. Uh, and then he gets in his chariot. And in the next scene, which is on the right side of the gate, uh, Ramses II gets into his chariot and single-handedly, this is without his army, he charges against the Hittites <laughs> and he crushes them, right? Yeah, and so phalanx after phalanx, uh, you know, retreats in front of him. And at the rising of the sun, Ramses II is victorious. The Hittites are destroyed. And here we have this scene here where all their horses and chariots are in disarray. And there's Ramses on the right, uh, bigger than life. And, um, you know, his, the cavalry eventually comes in to, to mop up after he's done, right? So this is, this is the scene we get. Um, and of course, uh, for the longest time, it was simply, uh, you know, uh, uh, reported by academics and scholars as just a radical piece of political propaganda, right? Ramses is showing that he is the god-man of Egypt. This is 13th century BCE, you know, it, apparently contemporary with Moses, right? The same, same time period, and he supposedly is the same Pharaoh. Um, so, but... Uh, uh, and so, you know, it's interpreted as he is just promoting himself as, you know, the, the leader that uh, overthrew the Hittite army. And so that's the way it was uh, for a long time after, the, after these scenes were uh, deciphered. But then in the early 1900s, uh, a man by the name of Schwaller de Lubix, who uh, was a self-trained um, Egyptologist. Uh, by the way, all the early Egyptologists were self-trained. There, there was no, you know, there was no school of Egyptology. They're all, they're all self-trained. -tra Petrie and and the whole lot of them are are self-trained. And uh, De Lubix, uh, French, incredibly intelligent, bright guy. And he lived in Egypt for 15 years, um, and he did an, an entire survey of the Temple of Karnak, and he realized that something was going on with this. Um, uh, temple frieze in stone, and I think he uh, had some very brilliant insights. So we're back here to the right, uh, left side of the gate, and we have Pharaoh facing one direction, Pharaoh facing the other direction. Uh, so it turns out the smaller Pharaoh facing right is actually on that temple facing west. He's facing towards the setting sun. And he leads his chariot army at the setting of the sun, okay? The bigger pharaoh seated there, same person, is facing east. He's facing towards the rising of the sun. And he's receiving the power and blessings and prayers uh, of, the, uh, of the sun priests, right? So he's uh, empowered at the rising of the sun to go into battle. Then he faces west and he goes into battle. And... Uh, when the sun sets in the west, what happens? Well, it gets dark, right? And this entire battle scene gets dark. Uh, he finds himself uh, totally um, overthrown, right? He's, he's by himself. His, his ranks of chariots are scattered and gone. And at the darkest hour of the night, he is alone. And that's when he turns to Amon and, and says his prayer, and at the darkest hour of the night, just so happens to be the hour that the sun starts emerging out of the underworld in Egyptian mythology. And sure enough, after that prayer, he reascends with the sun by himself as the solar chariot to overthrow the Hittites. So what Delivic said is, wait a second, this entire historical narrative is being analogized with the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Because in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the uh, neophyte descends into the underworld at death. And he goes through all these trials. And there's all these, you know, all these opponents and uh, all these things he has to overcome. And at the seventh hour, the darkest hour, he is or she is uh, completely isolated and 
must face um, must face the reality of who he or she really is in deity. It, it is the most treacherous point of the underworld journey for the dead. And if they can pass all the trials, if they can pass the darkest hour of the night, then the sun god sends them aid and they begin reascending out of the underworld with the sun to obtain their uh, eternal life in a divinity. So, so the entire historical uh, vignette that we see here on the temple gate, sure enough, it is a radical piece of propaganda. But at the same time, it's been analogized with the central religious mythos of the Egyptians. So that there's an internal logic that's occurring here and that really Ramses is following the uh, role of the initiate as he descends into the underworld, dies, is reborn, and reascends out of the underworld for total victory. So what we have then, um, is the connection, the confluence of myth and history. Uh, the Battle of Kadesh really happened. It's a completely uh, historical event. Ramses II was a completely historical figure. Um, but the history we get told on the temple wall can't be interpreted as you know, what actually happened, a blow-by-blow -blow account. It's all been mythologized. But the mythologizing isn't um, arbitrary. It's not random, and it's not just propaganda. It is propaganda, but it is not just invented to uh, promote uh, Ramses II as if, you know, he's, I'm the greatest pharaoh in the world, right? Uh, uh, ancient version of Trump or something. But he is, um, he is being analogized with the center cult system and cosmology of Egyptian religion. So... Literally, uh, we get this, uh, this vignette here where history is being mythologized, which is what people do in the 13th century BCE. Okay, and uh, if, the, you know, and this is uh, the time of Moses, plus or minus a few centuries, you know, historically speaking, this is what is done. So, uh, and this is what is done from uh, the foundations of Israel. Uh, all the way until centuries later, we get literate priests not mythologizing history, uh, writing the Torah. But before that, the oral tradition, oral peoples mythologize history. Now, just think about it for a sec, Derek. For us, we create histories by um, thousands of footnotes, right? Uh, good historians have journals and newspapers and um uh, you know, biographies and books and sources and personal interviews, right? They've amassed all this information by which they, they compile a history. How much of that do oral peoples have, people without writing? And the answer is zero. None of it. They don't have any of that. Now, of course, the Egyptians are, are, are literate in the 13th century BCE, but it's a different kind of literacy. It's not uh, the full literacy of, say, the uh, classical Greeks. That is to say, they're using different alphabets, um, and they've got one foot still fully in the oral cult, um, and one foot in textual analysis. The medium is the message, and so, and so it takes centuries after the invention of writing for a fully literate consciousness to emerge, and we start getting that in classical Greece. This is the difference between ancient Greeks and every other society. Um, but as it turns out, oral peoples mythologize history. They can't collate thousands of footnotes with thousands of sources. They can't do that at all. Uh, what they do, um, therefore, and I really hate reading on podcasts, but I, I, I'm just going to read one paragraph. <laughs> okay, one. okay. Just one. Uh, this is, and, and this is self-serving. It's out of my own book. So... So, so gotta me. get it, gotta uh, get it. You gotta get it. But let me just uh, read. Um, in oral societies, real and historical details of a person or event last in the memory for about a century. 
A grandfather can tell a grandson about his experiences. The grandson eventually tells his grandson what he has learned. After that, the initial teachings of the first grandfather may degrade. To maintain historical continuity, persons or events that must be remembered are placed within a specific memory theater set up for them. Myth. Oral peoples have a set of narrative templates. These templates are products of their cult and cosmology. In other words, they are associated with the rituals and festivals that are constantly maintained and familiar to everyone. So myth just isn't random. It's just not arbitrary. They're just, they just don't invent stories. What happened there at the Temple of Karnak is the historical event was analogized with what everyone knew in the priesthood of the temple cult, the Book of the Dead, the journey of the dead in the underworld with the sun, right? That's what they analogized with it. So if you want to remember an event or a person, you are going to put them in to a narrative template that everyone knows, and that's going to be your cosmological cult system. In this case, that was the Book of the Dead and the Journey of the Dead in the Underworld with the Sun, okay? Um, people of renown are placed within these templates and their stories are mythologized so that they can be remembered for generations. The process is reversible so that when a particular teaching must be transmitted, a myth is told rooted in historic fact. Eliade observes, the historical character of the person celebrated in epic poetry is not in question, but their historicity does not long resist the action of mythicization. Eliade reminds us that myth is not the first stage of the development of oral history, but the last. So by the time mythologies are produced, you're at the last stage of the historical process of the oral mind. Um, so, so trying to uh, reverse that process, there's going to be some complications, no matter absolutely. who you are. Even if an oral, I'm going to go so far as to say, yeah. even if an oral person was trying to reverse the process from another culture, they still wouldn't pin down what probably really happened. There's no way to do it. And so in the literal sense, in, in the whole, in the I'm literal not going to say sense. some of it, right. I'm not saying some of it you can't pull out, right. but we don't know always exactly where, and you're suggesting the literate people, the writers, the guys who came on with alphabets and fully known language that's been written, they're, I'm not going to say every author who wrote this, they might have understood, hey, this is not literal, but definitely something happened over time, and it's not, what we, what we think of is not the way that it was meant to be understood. That's the best way I could put it without trying well, to pin no, down. You're, you're, abs you're absolutely right. I, I, I couldn't have said it better. Um, so, right, uh, it, to reconstruct the history in myths is, um, uh, it's like interpreting rock art. It's uh, nearly impossible. Um, uh, so there's only a few things, you know, when I look at rock art, <laughs> I, 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 I give the measurements, I show how the sun works with it, right? I, I observe what I can prove, but actually interpreting it without any context is almost impossible. Um, look, even Derek, in classical Greece, right, in, in 5th, 4th century BCE Greece, the Greeks could not agree what Greek mythology meant. <laughs> okay, look, you had uh, the humorists who believed it was historical, that uh, the Greeks emerged from historical peoples who got mythologized and divinized, divinized. Um, and so that's the whole school of people who believed that the myths were historical. Okay, so guess what? That's always been on the table. As far back as you go, if you were to go back and say, hey, was Orpheus real? Most people would tell you, of course he was real. Um, and was Dionysus real? It was Heracles real? Uh, yeah, of course he was real. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, you had other Greeks who said no. Uh, it's uh, the natural sciences. That's what myth represents. Other Greeks said, no, it deals with religious initiations. It's an uh, allegory for initiation. And other uh, Greeks said, no, uh, it's just fable. It's just made up. Okay. They were having the same arguments 
oh, you know, 2,500 <laughs> years ago that you're having on your show today. That's awesome. But, but That's now, awesome. Li- but listen, they're, they're the Greeks, right? They're, they're, they're the ones that have transmitted this stuff to us. And by classical Greek, Greek times, uh, 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 you know, it was already. Now, why was that the case? And that's because classical Greece emerges in a, you know, most Greeks still were non-literate, but it is a fully literate system. And the, the fully literate scribes are the ones uh, transmitting this to us. We're getting everything through their lens, and that's probably not the accurate lens to get it from. In fact, it's definitely not the accurate lens to get it from. And so, um, uh, so we're just reading. You know, ninety percent of the writing in Egypt comes from southern Egypt uh, in the upper classes. So everything we read of all the Egyptian hieroglyphs and the, the myth systems and the ritual systems. It is just reflecting, you know, a point of view of a small class of people. <laughs> uh, and so uh, the, the bottom line is, uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult to uh, put myth back together. It's Humpty Dumpty. Put, put myth back together. Can, can I make a comment? This is, <clears throat> this is my opinion, right, right now. I have an opinion that's constantly evolving, literally by the day. I'm I'm learning things by the day. I cannot I am well, absolutely good. open-minded. I am not a strict anything. In fact, I found myself more agnostic because I said it's probably better that I'll be safe and say I don't know based on all the stuff because what we do have has been convoluted by church fathers and stuff and I know I'm jumping ahead. I don't want to go there. I'm just making the point. I'm being careful because the way I look at it is this. We used to not think that Troy existed. I mean, I remember when scholars thought that, and then we found it. We used to think the Philistine did not exist. Hold on. What happened? Well, guess what? I'm going to remain open-minded, even if I'm like, "Eh, I don't know if there was, but I'm not going to be shut off to the idea that if evidence does come forward, I'm not going to say, hey, that that actually sounds like uh, there might have been a Heracles. Just, just saying, just saying, I don't know, you know, but I don't think we'll be able to prove there was ever a Heracles based on what we found so far, but it's not, it's not bad to suppose there could have been. And like you said, it's blanketed in such mythology to know, you know, Dr. Price likes to make the funny jab and he goes, what was he, an ancient bodybuilder, you know, and, and I mean, was the guy a strong man? I mean, they did make a story about it. Or was this a myth of the strength of the sun being superimposed on a person who might have just been a warrior or a fighter or a regular soldier who, you know, you just never know because could his strength have been just literally the strength of the sun being put onto a person? Therefore, there was no strong man necessarily. You you know what I mean? Just just as a parenthetical when it comes to Heracles, um, one – Heracles is not of Greek origin. Uh, uh, Martin P. Nelson, uh, The Mycenaean Origins of Greek Myth, that's a book, uh, uh, tracked uh, motifs of the Heracles labors in the Mycenaean age. So uh, Heracles was inherited by the Greeks, not created by the Greeks. Two, uh, most of the labors of Heracles archaeologically is found on the thr- in the throne rooms of the kings of the city-states. So the kings uh, took upon them the persona of Heracles as they sat in their throne, which means that the labors of Heracles, I mean, is is basically um, imbuing the power of rule to the the king of the city-state, which is interesting because uh, several Greek historians tell us uh, that Heracles comes from Egypt and that the first Egyptian king was Heracles. Um, And so... Uh, and, you know, so, so again, it turns out the Epic of Gilgamesh and the, Heric- the labors of Heracles have so many things in common that what we're breaching is a common cult mythic system that was shared throughout the Near East, in Babylonia, in Egypt, in Greece, in Mycenae, and it's, uh, and so, and, and so, uh, so Gilgamesh then is the Babylonian Heracles, uh, Greek Historians insist that it comes from Egypt and the first Egyptian king was Heracles. And of course, that's a a Greek name. Um, And then the entire series of labors comes from Mycenae. And so um, this is pulling that needle out of the haystack. Uh, What what is the real Heracles? And when you and 
Point two is that oral peoples have a completely different epistemology. They organize their history completely. You know, they can't uh, tell you a, a, a real biography of a person. Everything has to be encoded in memorable form because it has to be passed down orally. The reason why mythologies are full of outrageous characters and gods copulating with everything that moves and huge monsters and and heroes that are super strong. One of the reasons is it's easy to remember. You know, the more outrageous the scenario and the characters, the easier it is to remember. And so mythologies tend to be oversized, outsized, because that is a demand of orality. That's just a function of transmitting an oral process. But at the same time, I mean, you, you cannot transmit a, a biography of an individual. He quickly becomes, or she quickly becomes mythologized into um, the oversized cosmic processes by which they encode all their information. Literate peoples, we encode our informations in books. They don't have books. They encode their information in nature uh, and the cycles of nature. So what's happening in nature is, is sort of the spine of their stories. And then and then things are glumped onto that as far as history is concerned. But they do that, right? There's this intersection between myth and history and cosmology. And, um, you know, and it, it is finding a needle in the haystack by the time we come to it and uh, very difficult to do. But I can tell you this, um, in Haiti, uh, so you have uh, Haitian mythology. This is the Caribbean, right? And Haitian mythology is composed of three sources, uh, the native Haitians would, came from Mexico and Central America. They have all these war gods, Aztec and Mayan war gods. Um, the African diaspora, so the early 1500s, the first slave ships from Spain arrive in Haiti with African slaves, and they're there to process the sugar cane because sugar is what drove the slave trade in, in those centuries. And then eventually the French show up and take over the island. But So you have this uh, African... Uh, native Central American and Christian influences all in Haitian myth. But what's interesting, I bring all this up is because one of the things uh, the people of Haiti do is <clears throat> they worship the dead. They have an ancestor cult. And if there's a particular person who did a great thing for the village, they will uh, memorialize that person. Um, and every year they, they'll mention him and they'll bring him back to life. Now, they'll, they even have rituals to, to draw them up from the underworld. This is the whole possession thing. This is the origin of our zombie, by the way. The Walking Dead, it emerges from, it emerges from this myth cult system. Take notes. Yeah, and so, um, but over generations, you just can't remember the specific person. And so the person turns into an archetype. They turn that person into a loa, a, a, a Haitian deity. And so the, the loa then kind of expands and incorporates the biography of the person that they were trying to remember. And soon enough, the person is forgotten, but the loa is remembered. But the loa now has an attribute that came from the actual historical person. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And so this is how, this is how it happens in Haiti. It's how it happens in oral societies. And so you get these deities or these heroes, such as Heracles. Um, and, you know, this, I, you know, I'm not going to go around and say Heracles is, is historical. Right. Uh, no, I understand. I, 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 that's not what I'm saying. You're not closed off to there having been an original basis for why the archetype developed to be. That's what I'm saying. There could be a core. And that it's not correct. dumb in any way to think there's a foundational reason for, you know, I'll just give you one example, jumping to Jesus and why I think this is important. Someone mentioned recently. Oh, we'll talk it, about Jesus. Okay. So then I don't want to steal any thunder. <laughs> no, I, no, it's steal. Steal. Okay. Shoot, okay I, I, well, thunder, I, can't, Zeus. I honestly can't, I honestly can't steal your thunder. Your thunder's too, you're so far above me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but uh, you know, Camille Gregor recently came on. He's a historicist and he said, you know, based on if you're going to do prior probability, like Dr. Richard Carrier, who's a mythicist, he said you wouldn't create, not saying there haven't been scenarios like the cargo cults, which are brought up by Dr. Carrier about how it didn't take long for them to develop a mythical character. But according to 
the idea of Jesus's historicity, they wouldn't have created a even a fictional, a historical fictional biography of a guy 40 years ago. It's just too soon. Now, if he was like slamming a guy 400 years ago, it's more probable that this could be based off of an archetype that could have possibly at some point in the past been based off someone else. But um, the idea that Jesus himself, and I'm open to this, I'm very open-minded to looking for the guy. I don't know if we'll ever find the guy, but nonetheless, um, he makes the point that in 40 years, 50 years, they're writing all this literature. And really, if you take Paul's dating back into the 50s, like very soon, so you, you have to ask, was he like you just described as a very important player in whether one wants to believe in the miraculous claim of the resurrection, which I myself am not, you know, I don't, I'm not convinced of that. At the same time, if what you're saying about this whole thing is true, this could have been a very good person who taught very deep things to a very uh, firm, strict followers of a small group, and they brought him back, so to speak if you will. And um, they, they live, let him live through them, if you will. And I don't know if this is a combination. I, I, I mentioned this to someone else. I'm probably fringe by just throwing this out there. Even though I don't believe this, I'm just throwing it out there that the Romans were ancestral worshipers as well. It makes me wonder with the influence of the Roman empire on this mystery cult type group, if there could have been some type of a, uh, element that was borrowed there and it's not strictly judaism but it's something that's saying we want to we really want to honor and keep this man in our in our we're gonna let him live through us so to speak so i don't, I don't know i don't know throwing out there <laughs> oh no that's uh, I, I, that's right um you know you're pulling at the needle in the haystack there um uh at, I, I, we're going to get into this it is yes, very sir. hard to fabricate a brand new world religion without historical basis. I I, I don't think that happened. So right. um, you know, hopefully uh, I, we don't lose half your audience, but I'm not a mythicist. That's okay. That I, don't, had... I don't, I uh, don't uh, agree. With, this is, the problem with, I have with Richard Carrier is, is not so much that he gets Jesus wrong as that he gets myth wrong. <laughs> In that, um, just because something is mythology doesn't mean it's not history. This is the whole point I'm, I'm making: is that um, uh, there will be, you know, in 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 um, oral cult systems, uh, a person that is in mythology um, is really a title. Like every deceased in Egypt became an Osiris, right? Osiris is the god of the dead, but every deceased who's buried with the book of the dead or buried in a, in a coffin with a coffin text is renamed Osiris, right? And of course, one of the etymologies, by the way, of Christ, Christus, is um, uh, K-R-S-P. Uh, those are the uh, consonants in the Egyptian uh, they didn't write with vowels, and it, it 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 meant corpse. It's where we get the word corpse, but it's also get where we get the word core, as in Marine Corps. And a Marine Corps is an initiated body, right? And so uh, an Egyptian corpse is an initiated body, initiated to what? Initiated for eternal life. And so the, the whole point here is that um, you can argue whether... Uh, Christ is historical or non-historical, but one thing's for certain, when you're baptized, you're to become a Christ, right? You become, you take on the name, you, you take on the identity. When the Greek uh, king sat in his throne, he became Heracles. That was the point. So if you walked up and said, ah, oh, do you believe Heracles was historical? Was he really real? He'd look at you like, yeah, look at me. Yes. Right. So, I mean, we don't think that way, but um, you, 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 take on the, the, you take on the role. That, that's right. how oral peoples also do it. I and might have to set you up with a discussion or a debate at some point <laughs> on myth with Dr. Carrier, because he, he usually will challenge PhDs, if anything. But uh, maybe there will be an interesting topic you can agree to debate over, um, not necessarily the historicity of Jesus, but myth itself. 
and and maybe I don't know something in that area. I, I I'm not trying to. No, I'd, 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 I'd be totally fine with that. It'd be wonderful. Um, yeah, no, it'd be uh, it'd be totally fine. Um, I I just don't uh, go as far as he goes. Uh, right which is to say there cannot be a historical Jesus. I I personally think it's almost impossible to start a religion without a historical person to put it on. I now, think there's all he... kinds of mythologizing that uh, we just looked at it. We, the, yes. the, the Battle of Kadesh in Ramses II, it's a historical vignette that is uh, mythologized. Um, and so we'll, we'll get into other examples as, as we get along. I do want to say for the record, just so he, he may pay attention to this video. Um, I want to say for the record, he doesn't say as a matter of fact that Jesus didn't exist. In his book on the historicity, he says there's a one-third chance. So it's based off probability. He thinks oh, okay. that there's a third chance, like it's not as probable that he was historical, and he uses the rank raglan idea. So he says there's like a bunch of other epic heroes that some are already like, I guess you'd say on record, most will say did not exist. Right. right. And then others did and he tries to compare them based on probability. So it's a big probability. He never says as a matter of fact. Now, some people who are mythicists, they are absolutely convinced and they don't even entertain. It's just, uh, he entertains. He says he entertains. I'm not well, gonna... Thank you for correcting me. I don't want to Yeah, no, 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 I know. What he says. But if it ever so, happens, you want to read his book, trust me, because then you can at least know what you're you know, right. talking to. Well, I, I should read his, uh, read his. I've seen him debate uh, and I've seen him on your show, actually. Yes, I, I watched yes, I watched that. So um, I just, uh, uh, there's this kind of brand of mythicism where Jesus is not historical. And I just, I, I you know, I, I'm a historical minimalist in the sense that you can't right. take everything in the Bible at face value. There's no newspaper editor walking around following Jesus, <laughs> writing down every word he says. That just right. didn't exist, right? And so... How does the text come to be? Well, this is what I'm going to be talking about tonight. How does myth and history develop into text? Um, and so... I'm here for the ride, brother. In fact, here we are. Um, so look, there's three huge areas of interest in when we get a text. Uh, how did the text get transmitted, right? How did we get it in our language? So how did it get translated? Where did it come from? How did it get to point A to point B? That's transmission. And how did it get into the language we're reading, right? That's translation, transmission, translation. And it turns out all of that in fact affects interpretation. Or we just ignore transmission and translation. We reinterpret how we want to reinterpret it. And then there we have it. Well, this is what's happened with... Uh, most modern texts. It's not just the Bible. Uh, we, we've dropped transmission and translation altogether, and we 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 just uh, you know Christians have reinterpreted it. But guess what? That's been going on for centuries, and Muslims have been uh, doing that with the Quran, and um, Hindus have been doing that with the Vedas, right? And and so uh, every generation reinterprets their text, and after a while, you lose how the text gets transmitted. You lose of the process of the translation. Well, uh, in biblical studies, we have a really interesting problem. And that is uh, Bible scholarship begins with the assumption that the Bible began with fully literate scribes writing fully literate history. That's how Bible scholarship, uh, Bible studies begins. Uh, this is a grand error. And so, uh, and so, of course, as time goes on, uh, scholars get more critical and they say, now, wait a second, we, we, we can no longer assume our a priori assumptions. But mind you, I, you, you know about the documentary hypothesis, right? Uh, the four different uh, sources in the Old Testament, you know, the, the Yahweh, the priestly, the Deuteronomist, the Elohim, right? You agree there's with the, it, right? You're right. There's four different... Uh, well, I agree with it to a point. The problem with that um, interpretation is it again assumes that everyone's literate. This is all working within uh, that, that, that somehow the writers of the Bible, including the documentary hypothesis writers, all had libraries and books around them and they are all literate and they're all trading back and forth with text and comparing text. Turns out that that, that 
may have happened in pockets of civilization. In fact, that you know, one of the theories is that you know Solomon is the wise king. Solomon, the wise, right? He he, he has a tradition of being the wise king going back to early Judaism. But if you read the Bible, he's a terrible king. I mean, he has like one episode where he saves a baby uh, from two mothers arguing over it. And this is what, you know, Christians say, this is why he's a wise king. But if you get past that chapter, everything else he, he does is cats and dogs living together. It's you a, it's forgot a- to mention <laughs> another positive thing about the guy. He had a thousand <laughs> wives. I mean, well, come so, on, man. That's right. <laughs> David falls because, you know, he, he sleeps with uh, Bathsheba and, he, and, of course, he murders her. Well, he makes sure her husband gets killed. And then a whole platoon of soldiers, he makes sure dies to hide his, his sin, right? So he goes from, you know, from uh, adultery to murder and then mass murder. Uh, so that's, you know, but so Solomon solves this by saying, well, I'm just getting rid of adultery, <laughs> right? I just, I've got, I've got, I know, is it 300 wives and 600 concubines or w- whatever it is, but. Crazy. Uh, but what he does is he's the first big city builder. Did he write the first Kama Sutra too? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I actually have uh, been to Kajuraho, uh, uh, India. They have a whole temple dedicated to the uh, Kama Sutra. Ooh. And there's uh, you know, sex scenes all over the exterior. <laughs> I, I've got, you know, this is why I got into mythology. Right, right. So, right. <laughs> um, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> But You're talking about like, Solomon, and I know I'm. Oh, oh yeah, so Solomon is the first um, uh, king that is, uh, you know, the big city builder. And in, in that, in those days, uh, to get notoriety and fame amongst the other city states, you built a court, you built a palace, and you built a library, and you collected all the traditions and all the scrolls from the surrounding area. This is why Solomon is probably the wise king. He builds a library. It's. It may be, I mean, this is speculative, but this is probably the beginnings of the writing of the Torah, where they start collecting the traditions of the Israelite nation, right? Um, So that's one of the theories. I think it's a good theory, uh, because, you know, technically, if you read the Bible, Solomon is not a wise king. He sets up the kingdom for a fall, and of course, his sons uh, completely decimate the kingdom, and, and so, you know, the kingdom of Israel lasts two generations, David and Solomon, and then it's cooked. And so it's, uh, and neither of them were good kings. Um, that doesn't mean they were, uh, they weren't morally good kings. They were competent. You know, David overthrew the Philistines, I mean, according to the historical narrative. Um, and so, uh, you know, so one of the interesting things I like about the Bible, I mean, so there's, you know, a lot of critics of the Bible, Derek, uh, the Bible canonizes its critics. Most people, if they wrote about their first king, would not put any bad information in it about the first king. The Jewish scribes said, David, here he is. He starts out, he's, he's the perfect follower of Yahweh. He slays Goliath. He does everything right. He becomes the king. He is righteous. He he is the perfect person. Then he becomes king, and he is God-awful. And they do not pull punches. He sleeps around. He murders, and he's God-awful, right? Most people wouldn't do that. Most people wouldn't do that. So there's all these critics who say, oh, the Bible, it's just full of you know, it's, it's ridiculous. And I would uh, argue differently. I would say that is, uh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. You are showing the shadow side of your own religion in your most sacred texts. And I, and that is what makes the Bible brilliant. And because it continually does that. It does does not pull punches. I got to ask, doesn't the Greek uh, religion do the same? I mean, in, in some cases, they seem like the uh, the gods even do some things. They they seem like they're not quite uh, benevolent at times or whatever. You know what I mean? Well, so look, there, you know, 
polytheists have a way to deal with the shadow side of their culture because they have different gods and goddesses. They have gods of light and they have gods of darkness and they're always on at the altar, right? And so that's one way to deal with the shadow side of your culture. But then monotheism comes in and, um, and pretty much you just focus on the light with the monotheistic God. Uh, and that's problematic. You, you, you also have to focus on the darkness and the, uh, uh, the Jewish scribes did that in, in the writing of the Bible, in my view. Uh, you, you, uh, Israel does not come off as, as great. It comes off as a broken, uh, a broken people, a broken culture, that they never get their act together. They, they're never following Yahweh. And, and as a result, it's a mess. It's a total mess from beginning to end. So... Uh, and I, and quite frankly, I think that's a, a brilliant way. That's brilliant in my view, because that, uh, that keeps you humble. I, so anyway. It does. No, I, I, I can uh, dig in and people will also argue, <clears throat> I've heard the argument of embarrassment to be used in this as evidence to kind of suggest, would you really fabricate all that? I mean, or would you not think there were probably some people who really did these acts and, they're just laying it out there trying to be as honest as possible. Oh, there are people who did these acts. Right. Because this is what people do. Yeah. I mean, right. I think a lot of the laws that are given, you know, are there because people were doing the very thing the law is saying, do not do this. So, yeah. Derek, history is a mess. Uh, you know, yeah, religion is a mess because it's historical. It, it, it's a mess. People are a mess. You and I are a mess. Uh, and, I don't and, know, you know, I'm just kidding. Oh, well, I'm a mess. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you've just, uh, reached nirvana, personal nirvana, uh, individuated, but, <laughs> but I, I, I'm going to have a, you know, a shot of whiskey when this podcast is done <laughs> just to get through. So, all right. Um, all right. So th the bottom line is I, I have, you know, three examples here, pyramid text, Epic of Gilgamesh, the Bible, the pyramid text, where do they come from? Right. Suddenly there are texts in pyramids before there was nothing. Right. And so you get all these texts. Uh, you know, the Pyramid of Unis is the first pyramid text. And um, and it's a fully complete religious tradition. And it turns out that fully complete religious tradition appears like a thunderclap on the historical horizon fr from the first dynasty. Uh, what that tells us is the Egyptians didn't invent it. They inherited it. This stuff has been going back into prehistory, right? And so it all comes from oral tradition. Same with the Epic of Gilgamesh. And, and I've already said the Bible was supposed to be different. It, it, was suppo it, it wasn't supposed to originate in the oral tradition. Uh, in fact, uh, most early Bible scholars said the Israelites had no mythology. They had history, right? Uh, that's just incorrect. If you're an oral society and the Israelites were, you have mythology because that's what, how oral uh, uh, mythology is simply the oral narrative you're passing down. Ritual, ritual is a somatic narrative which repeats the mythological narrative. Uh, your temple cult is your hieratic narrative that repeats your ritual and your myth. And so they're all layers of each other. And this is how oral peoples transmit information. So we recognize that the pyramid texts are mythological. The, the Epic of Gilgamesh is mythological, but somehow the, the origin of the Bible is supposed to be different. Uh, but that just doesn't respect the religion of the Israelites because the religion of the Israelites um, certainly exists in that, same, in that same universe. So I thought we would just give some examples. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go through and talk about some different texts from the ancient world and how different oral and literate processes get imbued upon them. And then we'll end by saying, okay, now that we see all of this in history, how can we reinterpret the formation of the Bible based off what, what we've just viewed? Okay. So, you know, here I have these uh, two little choral dancers. Uh, this is uh, taken in Mexico. I, I think that might be Monte Alban. Um, oh, many decades ago, Derek, um, scholars reading the Rig Veda, this is uh, India's oldest religious text, it goes back 1500 BCE, 
Um, and so this is uh, the oldest stuff they got. Well, decades ago, scholars began noticing that a lot of the passages in the Rig Veda could not be understood <clears throat> reading it as if there was a sole scribe writing it. That there were multiple characters talking back and forth to each other, and they began realizing that what they were reading was actually a sort of play, a drama, and that these were characters uh, speaking to each other, and that the text had to be read in the context of viewing it as, as being performed by two or more dramatic personae, two or more ritual actors who were performing the text. The text was an afterthought, right? Something else was going on. Uh, this was a performance. Okay, well, so they started to notice that in the Rig Veda, and then they realized, my goodness, most of the Egyptian funerary texts are written in this way. The Book of the Dead isn't a book. It's a ritual. And uh, the Book of Breathings, which is a later uh, funerary text, is very often is basically notes telling the priest what to say and do at the different stages of the ritual that they are performing as they are bringing the dead back to life. And so these texts are, are the, the, the text part of it is secondary. What your, the, 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 the ritual that was being performed was the primary thing. And so now the question is, how do you understand um, a text where what you are reading is really just the cliff notes and the prop list? Because that's what it is. It's, it's not like we're reading a full Shakespearean drama where all the lines and characters are fully laid out. In these ancient texts, the pyramid text, the Epic of Gilgamesh, what we are getting is the, is the uh, narrative footnotes and the prop notes. The main play never gets recorded. Okay, so then how do you interpret it? And it turns out you can't. I mean, so let's just cut to the chase. We really don't know what the pyramid texts are telling us. No Egyptologist can tell us because the main part of what it's all the texts are basically epithets, mythological, cosmological epithets, mytho, mythological scenarios that are summarizing what the priest and the cult is actually doing. But the actual belief system doesn't get laid out in a literate process for us. Okay. So our earliest texts uh, come to us as sort of disjointed because the, the majority of what we want to know never gets written down. So now here's the thing. Hold on to your underwear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lament of Alexandria writes that the, of the Christian tradition, that the most sacred things of deity are not for writing, but only for speech. Okay? That's what he says. The most sacred things of deity are not for writing, only for speech. Now, if we take that literally, what he's telling us is there are aspects of the Christian tradition that could not be written down. And what aspects are they? The most sacred. The heart of it. That could not be written down. I'll that, go, I was going to say, this is beautiful, John, because I'll go so far not only with the Christian, but the oldest or earliest we can find of Judaism, or not even Judaism, oh, absolutely. ancient absolutely. Israel. Because <clears throat> I talked to Dr. Bob, and I'm sure you're aware, I'm preaching to the choir with you, but I'm just saying it for our audience to remind them because they've been following a lot of the shows. Dr. Bob talks about how a lot of these stories don't necessarily, they weren't originally, they, they had to thread them together. They were not originally together, like Genesis 1 and 2 did not originally belong. And they threaded these things. And to me, that's quite interesting, like Lot. One can look at Lot and look at Noah and say, what a silly book. Because Lot is the last guy on earth. He literally ends up with his two daughters, okay? Why didn't he just walk across the land to Abraham and take some girls over there? It didn't make sense, right? And Dr. Bob said, listen, they held on to these traditions because they were sacred to them. But Lot is the end, just like Noah is an end. 
And I actually threw out there, I want your thoughts, because you wrapped your head around some very old material. And what do you think about the proposition that Genesis 1 is another flood narrative? It's not uh, what we've been told. It's literally the land drying up. The water is receding. The heavens and the birds in the air, you know, all the animals are coming out again. It's a flood narrative. And what did you say about floods? The number one guy who's ever said anything about a flood narrative is you. That is where eternal life can be found. So there's something very interesting there about the flood narrative. And I wonder, do you think Genesis chapter one is doing that? Uh, well, absolutely. Uh, so um, we could have a whole show on this. <laughs> we'll do uh, another the, show sometime. The, the, uh, the um, ancient cosmology uh, believed that you know, the, the world was created but oral peoples are cyclical thinkers, right? They're not linear thinkers because literacy changes that. Oral peoples are connected to the cycles of the sky. You know, the seasons are cyclical, so all time is cyclical, right? So if there's a creation, there's going to be a destruction of the creation. So how does things get recreated? So you, you introduce the flood narrative as your recreation narrative. Uh, and so it turns out, Flood mythologies around the world are almost always associated with the creation stories of the culture, right? So that's just not Christian. That's worldwide. The flood myth and the creation myth. And, and again, let me just say the word myth doesn't exist in their vocabulary, these uh, people who use them. That's our word. We're, telling, we're, we're saying this is myth. And so it's a different category. Please know that for them back then, myth was reality. It was the it was truth and reality. We we say no, no, it's not. History is truth and reality. Myth is something else. That's not the way they saw it. But the bottom line is, in the Bible, you have three stories that are rooted in ancient temple cosmology: the creation, the flood which is destruction of water and the fire, destruction of fire, which is the story of Lot. And if you go through the text, you will find parallelisms between the creation story, the flood story, and the story of Lot. So what, that tells, what it tells me is that originally, all three of those stories belong to an original corpus of oral tradition. And by the time the literate scribes write it down, they retain it, and they've retained the parallelisms that run through them. But of course, it gets historicized, right? We saw on the Temple of Karnak how history got mythologized. What the Jewish scribes are doing is they're historicizing the myth. And so, um, and so, uh, yeah. So the, to your to your question, the uh, creation story actually descends from this. It descends from ritual. The text we get is the prop notes. It's not what was really going on. If you compare Genesis 1 with Exodus chapter 40, which is the uh, day of the new year of the Hebrew calendar, that's when they celebrated the creation. And what did they do? They set up the tabernacle in the wilderness. And how did they set it up? Each step uh, coincided with the day of creation. So now you have to ask yourself, is the creation story a story about an actual creation of the world, or is it a story about the erection of the temple and the power of God in that society? Because now the context is different. It's now ritual. It's also cosmology. It happens on the, on the new year, right? So Plus the it creation has a story structure to is, it. A, is a, is a uh, ritual that has been turned into a text and attached to that ritual was a flood narrative, which was turned into a text. And attached to that was a, a, a fire narrative, which became our story of Lot. And, if, and so we could go through all the parallels. That would take two hours. But, but they're there. Yeah. And it's clear that um, uh, those stories belong together in, in a single uh, uh, tradition. So a mythological tradition. Anyway, uh, my point with this slide is that the earliest texts weren't texts. They were songs, dances, chants, choruses, and rituals. And when they get turned into texts, we lose the majority of what actually was going on, right? And so, and so now, 
now it's really hard to pull the needle out of the haystack, right? It just is. I mean, because we've lost the majority of the contact. And if we take Clement at his word that the most sacred things of deity, we have to understand that in the ancient world, to oral peoples, the most sacred things you do not disclose. We are completely opposite. We, you know, in, in the academic wor world, it's publish or perish. If you're not telling everyone what you know, you're no good. In the ancient world, it's the exact opposite. Publish and you will perish. If you tell people what you know, we'll kill you because it's sacred. It should only be disclosed to the people who can handle it. Now, you can go on and say, well, you know, that's a way to control the population, a way to control. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's the way they treated sacred knowledge. Okay. And so the bottom line is, uh, did that kind of attitude towards sacred knowledge exist in first century Christianity? According to Clement, it did. And we have other uh, church fathers that also say that it did. And so uh, if that's true, then something else was going on amongst the first century Christians uh, besides just, you know, the gospel canons and the letters of Paul. There was a whole ritual tradition. Uh, that was the most sacred part of the religion that never gets recorded. Or, or maybe part of the narrative in the gospel is a, a narrative form of that ritual system that got historicized, right? We'll talk about that in a second, because that happens in the Old Testament. Um, all right, here's another thing. Uh, oral peoples can't memorize a phone book. They can memorize a lot but they're not going to keep track of every personal pronoun that of all the people in their tribe, right? It, you quickly lose sight of that. And so if you are going to remember a person or historical event, what happens is the person, the actual person's name quickly gets changed to a typological name. The name in the myth identifies the person's role in the story. Okay. And so we see this happen in the Bible all the time, right? Adam is the first person created from the earth, and his name means earth. He's named after the role he performs in the story. <laughs> Enoch is, okay, so we only get a couple verses in the Old Testament of Enoch. If you go outside the, the canonized scripture, he's everywhere. In extra-biblical tradition, uh, you know, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Enoch has mentioned more than anyone else except Isaiah. And so what that tells you is the Dead Sea community, Enoch was, besides Isaiah, the biggest guy in the tradition. Okay? And, and so our, our Enoch literature, sadly, is very late, other than his mentions in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the books of Enoch we have are, are very late. His name means initiate. And in every Enoch tradition that has survived... What is he? He is the person, he's the culture bearer, right? He's the Hermes Trismegustus. He's the Oanes. He's the Gilgamesh. He is the person who's initiated into the eternal world. He learns all the eternal order of things, and he brings, and he teaches people writing, books, astronomy, mathematics, farming, all the arts. So his name actually fills the role of the, of what he does in the narrative. As you go on down through the Bible, you find this all the time. And so, again, a lot of people say, oh, this is just silly. Obviously, this is mythology and it can't be historical. Uh, what I'm saying is, well, actually, this is what oral peoples do. Uh, there, if there's a person they want to remember, they quickly drop his name and they rename him uh, based off what he did for them. Okay. And so, so it's fair to say, just, I don't want to stop here. I just want to yeah, say, yeah. it's fair to say the person who actually existed in history may not be the name in the narrative. Almost never. Okay. Right. So, so, um, I mean, Abraham is the father of many nations, right? His name means father. Right. And so, boy, that, that's a, that's a really good coincidence. These people keep naming their kids, you know, based <laughs> on what they do. Well, this is what, this is what orals, this is how you mythologize history. Okay. And so again, Eliade says, uh, we don't doubt the historical nature of the, the people in, in, in the epics, but quickly all their story becomes mythologized. It becomes, uh, it, it, it gets changed into memorable form, right? 
people, well, people probably, you know, if, if people wanted to remember Derek Lambert, um, you know, after a thousand years, your name would no longer be used. But whatever you did for the society, somewhere, somewhere in the narrative, that would be told. Along trash, with a bunch of other trash, stuff. Trash man Lambert. Do. That's right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Along with a bunch of other stuff that you didn't do because there's pieces from other people and there's uh, cosmological things and there's religious things. And so, again, you're pulling the needle out of the haystack. It's, it's impossible to do. But these patterns exist. Okay? And so this is another thing that oral, uh, oral peoples do. And now we get into literate people. Okay, so we're, we're not, um, uh, so now you know, they're using writing, but early literate people treat texts differently than we treat them. And they treat history different than we treat history. Modern history with all of our cited sources is a modern invention of the past few centuries. That did not exist before that. So the compilers of the Bible, they were concerned with history, mind you, but they were encapsulating the history they were concerned with from oral tradition, which has already been mythologized. It's already happened, right? And so um, the rehistoricizing, but one of the things you find in the Bible is a chiasmus, uh, which is a way that uh, scribes wrote down their stories in, in parallel ideas and so here we have the flood story out of the bible and if you go to here on the left oh let me use my cursor it's chapter seven eight of genesis you'll find that um you know noah has to wait seven days to enter the ark um there's a second mention of him waiting the seven days it rains for 40 days the water's on the earth for a total of 150 days god remembers noah and says okay i better save him uh, there's a second mention that Noah waits for 150 days, another mention of the 40 days, and then he sends out the bird for seven days and another waiting of seven days. In other words, there is this parallelism that the scribes have used throughout the biblical text, mind you, as a way to organize the story. Now, now here's, here's what's really, so I have this another example, of, which is a longer chiasmic structure of the entire flood story. So here's one of the things that the documentary hypothesis scholars did in the early days. They noticed this parallelism, and so they uh, sourced the first half to one author and the second half to a second author, and they said they're splicing them together. Well, essentially that's wrong. This is actually a literate structure of these early texts. So, but... What that tells us is they've uh, dispatched with having reporting history as only the facts as their primary concern. They're using different structures by which to record their stories. And, and this is one way in which they, they do that. And so the stories turn in to these sort of parallels, mirror images of each other. Uh, and that's how the, the scribes remembered them because... Most of these scribes, even though they're literate, actually are still chanting the stories. You know, um, have you heard the term library carol? You go to the library and they're the little desks that you sit in and they're called library carols. Yeah. Yeah. The word carol means singing. And medieval monks literally sung the text they wrote as they wrote them. That's why it's called library carol. Okay, and so this kind of structure is the way these uh, scribes approached the material uh, because it was the way they uh, helped them organize it and remember it. So again, the primary structure of the text isn't on historicity, it's on how do you memorize it and record it, right? Are you following? Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, this, and so This is good. So you get this kind of structure that exists uh, not only in the Bible, but in various ancient texts around the world. And then, um, and then you get something really interesting. Uh, scholars in medieval texts. So this is centuries after, you know, the birth of Christianity. This is through the Middle Ages. Scholars are, are reading biographies of saints that have been compiled by medieval scribes. And they start noticing something. Saints that have similar names or the same name will have remarkably similar biographies. And then they start realizing, wait a second, 
these monks who are writing these uh, histories of the saints are simply borrowing uh, from one text to another. So if there's a St. Bartholomew here and there's a different St. Bartholomew here, they're saying, well, we know they're two different people, but they're both named Bartholomew and therefore they must have been ordained by God to share the same roles. So I'll pull this from this narrative and I'm going to pop it right here because it's the same divine presence in both of them. Now, of course we don't think that way, but this happens through the Middle Ages. And that the point I'm trying to make is that the monks in the Middle Ages treated texts differently than we do. They treated history differently than we do. And it's not that they were lying or cheating or, or um, oh my gosh, I'm having a brain cloud. Uh, when you steal a text from another text, what do you call that? Uh, you're talking about... Plagiarizing, plagiarizing. Yeah. Plagiarism didn't exist. There wasn't even a concept. Um, it's simply how they treated texts. They, they, they saw in, in history... If something happened to one person and that person was born in the same town or had the same name or, or similar things happened to a, uh, uh, from one person to another, they saw a connection and they would often sort of infuse <laughs> the different stories across each other. And so they would, you know, they would put part of the story into this and part of that story into that. Well, you know, again, we're pulling the needle out of the haystack. That's a mess, but that's how they treated texts all the way through the Middle Ages. So again, this idea of uh, the modern historicity, everything being a historical blow by blow, yeah, that, that, that is modern and that is recent. And then I've been reading uh, um, Dennis McDonald uh, recently, really like his stuff. And you just did an interview with him uh, a little while ago. Derek, good for you. Uh, but I, you know, I, uh, he, he has a mimet, mimetic uh, structures that he is arguing, and I think he does it brilliantly. I, I, I'm, I, what I can say is that is how ancient peoples would treat a text. They would take a well-known text um, that was considered to be great or sacred, and they would construct another text based off the, the structural spine of the text everyone knew. And that's all uh, McDonald is arguing. He argues, for example, that Euripides Bacchae, the play, was the narrative structure that the writers of the Gospel of John used when they composed the Gospel of John. And so that there are these parallels between the two stories and texts that are really odd and strange, uh, but you know, his argument is they're just mimetically copying. Um, now, again, we would think, well, so none of this is history, but the, the historicity is, a, is another argument. What I'm saying is people in the ancient world treated text differently than we treat it. They treated history differently than we treat it. They treated it, um, uh, again, so our, our, our historical sensibilities have evolved over centuries and over time. And, um, and so we, we want to believe that everyone in the ancient past had the same sensibilities and we're learning, nope, not even close. And it's not that they weren't concerned with history, they were. But um, again, history gets mythologized, history gets restructured, the stories get restructured, the stories get copied from one to another, things are changing all the time. Um, and it, 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 it's not you know a conspiracy and people aren't lying. You know, sometimes that happens. There's forgeries and there's, there's all that sort of thing. But uh, most of the time, this is just how information is transmitted in these semi-literate societies. And then Period. sometimes even these forgeries aren't, <clears throat> I, I've, you know, as much as uh, Dr. Or Dr. Ehrman's wrote on this, you know, about the forgeries in his book Forged, there's sometimes they're doing it in not a like deceitful way necessarily. They're writing in the name of someone that they follow or you know, they might have an honorable reason for why they forged, but I know that he wrote in his book that it was not, it was, it was kind of frowned upon to do that kind of stuff. I don't know if it was in pockets that it was permitted, but you know, maybe within the cult itself, it was okay to write in the name of or something, but it probably wasn't widely acceptable. I don't know. Well, I, you know, I, I, I agree. I agree with you, Derek. Um, 
in that, uh, I mean, there are people writing forgeries to make money. So there's that motivation. But there are also people who will write a gospel for their community. And it's different from all the other gospels. And they've, they, you know, what have they done? They've, they've taken a, a mimetic structure from a, a core belief system that they have, and they've transferred it over to the Christian gospel narrative. And now they have a Christian gospel that they can believe in, right? I mean, there is no fax machine or email in the ancient world. You have all these different uh, Christian sects. I, basically, every city was its own Christian church. Uh, I mean, we get the writings of Paul because it was a mess, right? He's writing to everyone saying, no, don't believe that. No, don't believe that. No, you got to do this because everyone's right. on a different page, right? And there are all these different gospels. But here, here's, the, here's my point, and that is this. Um, human beings, we're, we're not really historical by nature. We continue to do this. Um, it, it's interesting. Uh, there are two things that happen in uh, social revolutions. You look at the 20th century, full of uh, actually very dark, grim social revolutions. Uh, communism, Russia, Nazism, Germany, a totalitarian uh, regime in Japan and in Italy. Um, they did two things in all these societies. One, first thing they did was they rewrote the histories. So they wrote a new gospel. And, um, and, and so, you know, are they lying? Well, they wrote the history based off their view of it, right? They, they, and so uh, the, they create new enemies for the society to attack, and the history uh, is written to provide a, a basis for the authority of the regime, okay? So this is happening not in the religious world. It's happening in the non-religious world, right? The 20th century was the bloodiest century in history, as far as we know, you know, almost 200 million dead uh, by the time you count all the wars. And most of this is uh, from the shadow side of the pseudo-religious, non-religious. There's lots of arguments to be made here, but the bottom line is uh, the first thing uh, a totalitarian regime does when it wants to take power is it rewrites its history. It writes a new gospel. And that's just consistent. And so we're still doing this. And the second thing that the totalitarian regimes did is they got rid of the church. So I know you have a lot of uh, critics of, of religion in the church on your channel. They either uh, destroyed the church or they subsumed it. They walked in and said, you're going to do everything we tell you to do or we'll destroy you. And many of the churches said, okay. So, you know, many of the Christian church became uh, you know, just a mouthpiece for the Nazi movement because they were given the choice, do this or die. So, uh, and why did they do that? And that's because the church was the only thing that challenged the power of the state. These totalitarian uh, people came in and said, we are the power. And the church said, well, actually God's the power. And you answer to him. And they said, nope, 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 nope. That's not the way it's going to work. And so uh, just, uh, just uh, as a reminder, uh, all social systems have shadow sides. There is bad religion in every religion, everyone. It's not, there's not bad religions. There's bad religion in every single religion. And there is good religion in every single religion. And, um, and I, I would argue this is, you know, there's a bad way to do the state and there's a good way to do the state. And when the shadow takes over, then, you know, the 20th century is an interesting lesson the uh, totalitarian regimes, they rewrote their histories and they got control of the church really quick. And then they did their things. So it's, it's important to remember that. Um, all right. And then uh, just uh, as, as we exit out of this uh, way that you know, at least medieval people approached uh, the, the, the biblical text, we have, uh, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas in his great uh, theolog uh, Summa Theologica. Um, right up front, say, how do we interpret the Bible? Uh, this was a huge issue for him. And he said, well, the first thing you do is you do interpret it literally and historically. Uh, but that only gets you so far. And then after that, you know, some of these stories have to be interpreted in other ways. 
morally, allegorically, and anagogically. So he lists it all out. And so for centuries, this is how Catholic priests were taught to teach biblical narratives. Um, you, there was the literal or historical sense. Uh, there was the moral sense, um, which is the way most people do it today. The moral sense is the devotional sense. So, for example, if you're teaching the story of Abraham and Isaac, uh, the literal sense is you would say, okay, Abraham really lived and he really had a son, Isaac, and God told him to sacrifice his son. And so he went out and built an altar and he was ready to sacrifice his son and the angel stopped. him. So that would, that would be the literal approach. And then the moral approach would be something like, well, what do we learn morally from this story? And I guess the teaching would be, be obedient to God and God will make sure that it works out for you, right? The angel will come and stop you. If maybe, you know, I've, there are all kinds of moral problems with, with that story. <laughs> I mean, if God tells you to sacrifice your son, I think the first thing you should say is, no, God, I'm not going to do that. You do that. Right? I mean, I've but, heard it is a reverse moral kind of story that it was common to sacrifice humans in that time. And it was trying to <clears throat> kind of like um, slavery, right? We talk about that's right, how right. we use our morals from today and impose That's correct. On, and that's, that's not correct. the approach. We did a show on that I just released. Right. But what is interesting about it is if you're going to take anything good from it, Israel at least changed their law and said, stop, we're not allowed to sell Israelites to Israelites. We're not even, there's no more of that. Yeah, that's correct. So that's there's a moral correct. lesson here trying to say, let's better ourselves and son. And maybe that sacrificing your child is another one of saying, don't do So this. that's one approach. And that is an approach that that's quite common is it's a story that stopped human sacrifice, which uh, it, it appears to have because the Israelites don't practice it that we know of after Abraham. Um, right. And so, uh, so that could be, you know, I, I actually heard a really interesting, a Jewish rabbi teach the story of Abraham. Please tell it, me something new. I love it. And, and it, I, I loved his uh, approach to it. And his approach was that Abraham failed the test of faith, that God expected Abraham to say, no, I'm not going to do that. If you want my son, you take him. I, I will not. So because Abraham in other places in the text argues with God, right? Um, you know, Abraham says, yeah, I'm going to destroy the city. And he says, no, 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 don't do it. If, if there's 50 righteous people, don't destroy it. And God says, okay, uh, if there's 50. And then Abraham realizes, well, there isn't 50. If there's 30, don't do it. You know, he keeps arguing with God and he tries to change God's mind. And both Abraham and Moses do this. And sometimes it appears they do change God's mind. So one of the, one of the interesting lessons, again, of, of, of biblical narrative is uh, you can argue with God. You can disagree with God. Um, and so this uh, rabbi was simply saying, Abraham, uh, God expected Abraham to, to make the argument. I'm not going to do that. But Abraham doesn't. And that disappoints God. So he sends an angel. And mind you, after Abraham raises the knife over Isaac, God never speaks to Abraham again. He always sends an intermediary, an angel. Before that, it's God and Abraham. Hmm. But after uh, he tries to sacrifice Isaac, Abraham only talks to an angel. Never so, thought about that. So, so, so the argument therefore goes that Abraham fails the test of obedience because what God was trying to teach Abraham was um, the moral conscience to stand up for the right, even against your own religious ethos. Hmm. And so I thought that was a brilliant take on the story of Abraham. But th again, that's a moral take. Yeah. And so, so it's a moral take. Uh, St. Uh, Thomas uh, says another way to interpret Bible stories is allegorical. Uh, and so what do the Christians do with the story of Abraham and Isaac? Isaac is Christ. He's the forerunner of Christ. He's the sacrifice, the only son. And so they, they turn the story into the allegory of the Christian message. And, and so, uh, that, that, and then anagogical is um, the story is relating to the end times, the eternal realm, right? And so, uh, I don't know how you would teach. Uh, uh, we are all Isaac on the altar of sacrifice, and we should be able to uh, willing to sacrifice our own lives in order to inherit eternal life. So there are four different 
ways to interpret the biblical narrative um, that St. Thomas uh, Aquinas um, uh, talks about. And so you get, therefore, uh, a wide variety of interpretations of different biblical stories using these lenses. Now, again, um, the literal sense is, the historical sense is presumed. I don't think most of these Catholic priests went around saying this didn't really happen historically. I think they did believe it happened historically. But, you know, a lot of the stories are hard to teach historically. And so they had these other uh, frameworks to say, well, you know, I don't know, but here's the allegory of it, or here's the moral of it, or here's uh, what we will know about heaven if we do this. And so... Um, so they had these different ways of interpreting biblical stories. And then something happens. The Protestant Reformation happens. And uh, what happens in the Protestant Reformation is a total rejection of Catholic authority, but also Catholic interpretation of Scripture. Right? It's not just rejecting the Pope and his priests and his priesthood. It's, it's rejecting the church and its rituals and its interpretations. And so after Luther, what starts to happen is more and more there is a very literal historical sense imbued upon the Bible narrative. And that is sort of, and, it's, and, and that's because by the time Martin Luther comes around, everyone who's making the arguments are historicists, they're fully literate. Uh, the oral tradition has been completely forgotten. They're not even aware of it. We had to re, we, we remembered this as we started to find other texts and, and everything I've talked about before, the rituals and the chiasmus. This is, this is all learning in the past century, right? When we've started to find these old things and say, hey, wait a second, there's more to this story, right? They didn't have any of that. And so, so the oral tradition was forgotten the rituals were forgotten. They rejected the Catholic rituals anyway, and the Catholic. And so we get really a, a strong historical interpretation of biblical story mm. post Protestant Reformation. And it's talking, interesting. Talking donkeys and talking yeah, snakes. Right, right, right. Talking donkeys, talking snakes. It all becomes very literal. You know, the Protestant Reformation is the first social movement in history that uses the printing press for social reform. And, you know, the printing press is 15th century, you know, a few de you know, a century later, you get the Protestant Reformation and you get hundreds of thousands of pamphlets flooding Europe, promoting Luther and the Reformation. And quite frankly, the Catholic Church couldn't combat it. I mean, this was mainstream media, uh, 16th century style, right? They, they, had, they, they had their priests teaching at the lectern in the cathedral and suddenly everyone's got a pamphlet uh you know they just didn't they couldn't combat it and so it's just interesting how these uh print structures uh combine with the literate thinking uh that the rejection of the old everything gets reinterpreted largely as historical so this is you know the beginning of uh, you know, and then in America, you have the Great Awakening, and this uh, eventually you get your fundamentalist Christian sects. And so there's a historical process by which people are taking biblical stories incredibly literal and historical. And, um, and it's a historical process, right? So, <clears throat> so how do we interpret the Bible? Well, we, we have to remember that um, in the beginning, for about a thousand years, uh, Israel had a oral temple tradition that was constructed around their myths, their rituals, their cosmology, and their temple. Uh, the creation story is a byproduct of that tradition. We get it as a fully historical, you know, scientific, you know, the, the creationists believe it's a blow-by-blow -blow account of how God created the earth, that the earth is 7,000 years old, and Right. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. This is a modern um, reinterpretation that has completely dropped all these, all these things that are on your screen here. Um, many of the stories began as rituals. Uh, 
many of the characters are typological. Uh, they're structured around memory systems or literary patterns that draw from memory systems. They uh, are constructed from analogical roots or mimetic uh, sources, other sources. And there's historical uh, information in it as well, right? Um, but this is sort of the, the, uh, the matrix by which we, we get the Bible. And you, you simply can't just sit down and say, well, God said it, and therefore, this is what happened. Um, so that's, that's just, <laughs> that's the deal. So just to recap, uh, and then we can uh, rabbit trail off whatever you want. But uh, to summarize, uh, I'm making some pretty important points. One, myth can contain historical content. Okay, so just because something is myth doesn't mean it doesn't draw from an actual person who's been mythologized or an actual event who's been mythologized. But whatever history is in myth, it doesn't long last the processes of mythologizing. And so the data gets turned into what can be remembered. The historical content is synthesized with cosmological and ritual patterns. So um, like uh, Ramses II, uh, the history is analogized with the journey of the sun through the underworld where he, this is his source of power by which he defeats the Hittites. So the story as told on the temple isn't history, it's trans history, it's ultimate reality. How did Ramses win? Well, he won because he is the initiate who knows the secrets of Amon and can walk with the powers of the sun and has power over the enemies of the Egyptians. So this is the central core system of our belief. It's what holds our society together. So this is how we're going to tell the story. Okay. Um, so now the question comes, and you already mentioned uh, Troy, you know, uh, for a long time, you know, people didn't believe Troy uh, actually existed. Well, if you, if you read the source material of Troy, there's still a lot of speculation, by the way. You know, I'm not so sure the, sure the city they've picked as Troy is actually Troy. <laughs> but what I can say is I, I think most of the characters of Homer's Iliad were historical characters. You know, the story being told by Homer isn't a biography of them. It's all mythologized. But um, the Greeks did fight the Trojans. And so, uh, you know, which city and where and how it happened, well, we don't know the blow-by-blow -blow account. But what about Gilgamesh, right? We have this whole epic of Gilgamesh. He's, that whole epic is mythology. And yet he's found on ancient kings lists. And so if you ask, you know, Near Eastern scholars, is Gilgamesh a historical person? A lot of them will say, well, probably, because he's on the king's list. And they put historical people on those king's lists. Now, the problem with the king's list is they're also mythologized, right? Some of the kings live for thousands of years. It's like the patriarchs in the Bible who live for centuries, right? The, the, the Near Eastern king's list share the same patterns of that. And so even the, the king's list themselves are being mythologized. But most people recognize, yeah, they're probably still historical people. And so Gilgamesh might be an actual person. But you can't prove it. You can't disprove it. You can't pull that needle out of the haystack. We just don't have enough information, right? King Arthur is another example. Yeah, most scholars will say, no, he's not a real person in history. But you got this tight-knit group of scholars who are good scholars who say, no, we believe he was a real person in history, right? And if you read the uh, you know, romantic tales of, of the Knights of King Arthur, those tales have all been mythologized. And guess what? Uh, Jesse Weston writes this great book in 1920, uh, From Ritual to Romance, where she talks about the, the rudiment uh, storyline of the romantic uh, stories of King Arthur's knights comes from the Greco-Roman mystery traditions. Comes from those, re same as uh, Jesus, right? Comes from those religious initiations because the knights will undergo many of the same initiatory perils and, and uh, problems that the initiates did of those religions. And so um, it's a fascinating book. Uh, so, but the bottom line is, is King Arthur real? And again, you know, I don't have a pony in the fight. All I can say is I've read 
uh, scholars on both sides. And some scholars insist he's not real and some scholars insist that he is. We just don't have enough information. The whole point though, is that just because something is myth does not mean it's not historical. And very often there's historical seeds all through it. Um, but you can't read it as real blow by blow history, right? It's not a modern history. It's, it's, it's mythologized. Um, fully sourced historical methodology is a modern invention. So it, we, I, I went over how even medieval monks treated texts. They copied one biography into another. They thought that was a legitimate thing to do. And so um, the way we look at history is really only a couple centuries old. I mean, you know, it's, it, you know, Herodotus is trying to record history. Um, there are Greek historians who are trying to record what actually happened. But to get a fully sourced methodology of modern history making is a modern invention. Okay, so that, that, that doesn't, that's not happening when the Gospels are written. Uh, people rarely fabricate history. They do rewrite it all the time. Okay, so I, this is another problem I have with mythicism is it, it seems to me, and I, I, you know, I, you can inform me what Richard Carrier believes, but that, that people are just fabricating Jesus. People rarely just make up stuff. And oral peoples don't. To mythologize a thing is to tell the essence of a thing. So again, using the example of, of Ramses, they're telling you the essence of the historical narrative by using the religious mythology. That's what they're yeah. doing. And so um, I just might as well plug what he, what I've picked up so far. I don't want to stop too far just to give you an idea. I think he takes more of an angelology approach. So it's not that he's completely fabricated and just fictionalized completely um, that Jesus is actually an angelic figure in in this narrative so he never was an actual man the idea of him being an angel right. who comes down to earth in the narrative um <clears throat> he's a form of an angel so to speak who oh, becomes who becomes son of man you should really check out his book i'd love to hear your criticisms too because i know you'll have some but all right yeah uh, email you know. me the book i need to read and i'll read it okay okay um Anyway, uh, the point is, is uh, people rarely fabricate history, but very often the histories we get are rewritten. And this happens even in modern times. Even modern histories eventually turn into ideological and archetypal tales. Now, I, I briefly mentioned, you know, just the 20th century regimes who rewrote their histories. But, you know, it, it happens in my own lifetime when I went to elementary and high school, the American founding fathers were demigods. When I got to college, they were all evil old white men who owned slaves, right? The narrative had completely changed. And I thought, well, no, wait a second, stop. Which is, which is it, right? Are they, are they demigods or are they wicked, evil old white men with slaves? And, um, you know, so you can, but the bottom line is people are arguing over the archetypes in the history making all the time, right? And so, I, um, you know, what's really interesting is sometimes history gives us both, right? Can, can a person be not a very good person and end up doing demigod kind of things? No, well, sometimes history gives you that. Oh, crap. You know, so, so you know, I just, it, it's, but the bottom line is history is, is, is difficult to construct. And, and every history is sort of an invention of the historian. And, uh, and so, you know, the point with modern history is you try to source it as, you know, thoroughly because all your uh, approaches are interpretations of the sources. And you have to admit that. And there are a lot of historians who don't. So and they're just bad historians. And, you know, this is happening today. This picture, by the way, is Glastonbury. It's the mythical resting place of King Arthur. That's why I put it in here. Um, so you know, did King Arthur really get buried in Glastonbury? Did Jesus, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, that's another tradition around Glastonbury that Joseph of Arimathea came and, and, and you know, uh, uh, taught Christianity. Well, see, these are all fables, um, I, probably with no historical context, <laughs> but, um, 
<laughs> so now, so now we, we take all this and, and I just thought we would go over some arguments. Was Jesus historical? Do we have time for this or are we done? <laughs> no, g- go for it. I, you know, I'm very open to hearing, you know, I love learning and listening to this stuff. Well, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say yes or no. What I'm going to say is um, in the ancient world, myth is seen as what is ultimately real an oral epistemology that sought to describe truth and reality. So what it's not is fabrication. What it's not is fantasy. What it's not is fiction. Ancient myth was truth and reality. We just do not, we do not think this way. This way of thinking is, um, you know, we, when we write a historical narrative, we do not write it the way the Egyptians wrote Ramses defeating the Hittites, okay? But in oral societies, history is retained that way. By the way, there's a really interesting story in the Bible, the Old Testament, that matches the narrative structure of the Temple of Karnak, the narrative of King Ramses, almost blow for blow. Really interesting. Really? What story? Yes. And what story is that? The story of the founding of Israel, the story of Jacob. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens with Jacob? He, uh, you know, he steals the birthright from his brother, uh, but then he uh, you know, goes to Laban, his father-in-law, and he lives there for 20 years or seven years or whatever, three seven-year periods. He marries two women, right? The Laban tricks him into marrying both his daughters. And then he goes back to his people, but he's a, uh, stolen the birthright from Esau, and he's afraid that Esau is going to kill him for good reason, right? Uh, And so he goes back into his land, and he comes to uh, the fort of Yabok, which is a, you know, it's a play on the name Jacob, Uh, but it's this river, and in all these underworld mythologies, the Book of the Dead, the darkest, you know, hour of the night, you come to this impassable sea, right? Uh, that you have to cross in order to reascend out of the underworld. So Jacob comes to a river. It's the darkest hour of the night. He says a prayer to Yahweh. An angel shows up. He wrestles all night. And at the rising of the sun, he overcomes his uh, interlocutor, sees the face of God, and is given a new name. Okay? So it's, it is a remarkable parallel. You know, uh, Ramsey's... Uh, faces the Hittites, he descends with the sun, uh, says his prayer at the darkest hour of the night, at, you know, at the ford of the underworld, reascends with the sun uh, to conquer the Hittites. Jacob does the exact same thing. It's the exact same historical structure, or the uh, narrative structure. And so what's going on there? Well, I, in my view, what's going on there is what the Egyptians did with Ramses is what the Israelites did with Jacob. The Egyptians analogized Ramses with the center of their cult, the Book of the Dead, which they didn't call the Book of the Dead. They called it the Book of Life. But the, the, myth, the mythology and the ethos of the underworld journey that gives one power to rise and conquer the enemies of the world. That's probably what's happening with Jacob. What we're witnessing is a narrative structure that is analogizing the ritual structure of the temple cult that the high priest uh literally went through some sort of underworld descent got to the holy of holies the veil parted the veil rose with the sun saw the face of god sent the throne this is a sort of priestly initiatory initiation that gets put into a mythological narrative that makes it into our story of jacob I would argue this is what's happening with the Exodus and Moses, and this is what is happening. So all your founding, your creation stories and your founding stories are your top candidates for the mythologies of the oral tradition, because those are the stories that oral societies hold the most sacred. So they're going to be retained. So your creation stories, so your, your early stories of Genesis are going to come from that oral cultic tradition. But then your founding stories, the founding of Israel, is also going to come from that tradition. And we get three of those stories in the Old Testament. You get Jacob, who is Israel. He's renamed Israel. You get Moses in the Exodus. And you get this really interesting story of the talking donkey, Balaam. And that he is the foreign soothsayer 
that uh, King Balak uh, hires to curse Israel as they're coming in to found their society in his land, right? And that whole narrative is actually a, a repetition, in my view, of the priesthood cult narrative that, that you get echoes of in the story of Jacob, you get echoes of in the story of Exodus. And that's because they're similar kinds of founding narratives. And so, um, so there you have it. You, you have these really interesting parallels and narrative structures that definitely come from the oral tradition. And if they come from the oral tradition, they're going to be coming from a, a ritual cosmological temple cult. And, um, and so this sort of thing is going to bleed into the narrative. Are you following that? Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. And the whole ritualistic approach is interesting, especially when you look at stuff like Genesis 1. A lot of people are wrestling with this. Is this ex nihilo? No. But um, is it purely temple? Here's my question. I guess this is why I think it's important to ask this. There are people who are researching this that will say Genesis 1 is purely the setup of temple. Um, for example, like Margaret Barker's type of work where she is describing temple language. We know it's temple language. It's obvious. But is not the world or the actual creation also a temple, uh, so to speak? It's, it's temple language. And the temple that they worship in is a microcosm of the macrocosm of the actual world we live in. That's correct. Oh, so you agree that that would be like a, a – the creation account is macro, micro – in in one that's correct i agree i agree look um look they have a completely different cosmology <laughs> uh so the um uh, you know again this is another show the mythological earth um is you know if you if you read books on uh, uh ancient israel cosmology they, they say they the you know the earth was sort of this sphere where th there were mountains around the perimeter that held up the sky and then, you know, there was the sky and, and uh, then God lived above the sky. And so they, they have this really simplistic disc-like idea of how the universe was made and how the world was made. That, that's modern scholarship. This is where they're saying, we think this is how the ancient Israelites conceived of the world. I, I flatly disagree with it. Um, you, you look at oral uh, societies, uh, the mythological earth is almost always um, an integration of the horizon with the sky. The mountains are almost always constellations that hold up the sky. Uh, and so, you know, you get the three tiers of, uh, of the ancient world, the heaven above, the heaven below, and the heaven in between, which is the material realm, the earth. And all of that is sort of this astrocosmological uh, structure that they see with uh, observational astronomy, the circumpolar stars in the north or is the heaven uh, above, the stars below, the celestial equator is the heaven below, and the earth between isn't the material disk you're standing on, it's that plus the stars up to the ecliptic. And so it, it is a celestial zone. And so the, the bottom line is they are conceptualizing things radically different than we are and so the creation text right. is a story about the creation of the world but it's it's not it's not pattern off modern ideas of you know, creation and science <laughs> it's pattern off ideas of your annual agricultural cycle and the power of the sun and stars and moon which give power to that agricultural cycle and you're politicizing it because your priest is your king and so you know there's all these layers yeah. that are a part of it that um that constitutes the creation story all of that's dropped in genesis one and two and i gotta so, i gotta ask you is it wrong of me and i'm not a bully at all but is it wrong of me to poke at that i used to think seven thousand year old earth literal ex nihilo you know do you find it wrong of me to, to to poke fun at that whole idea the way that people mistreat an ancient text like this I do it, and I don't mean it in a derogatory, but it might come across that way on this show. I poke at stuff like this. Guys who think donkeys really literally talk. Uh, snake, I mean, because I was that guy. I did not understand. Derek, that's the way I was taught it. That's the way I was taught it, right? So I, growing up as a kid, that's how I believed it. Right. right. It was all literal, and it was all real, and the earth was 7,000 years old. I wasn't old <laughs> enough to 
you know, to start asking questions of, you know, where do the dinosaurs come from? And, and, um, yeah. Uh, and they have answers for that, by the way. Oh, they got, <laughs> dude, I don't even want to start right now. There's some really clever <laughs> ones. <laughs> you know, is, but, but, um, I, you know, yeah, go ahead, poke it. Uh, look, no, it, yeah. it's, uh, it's, um, I think we're doing a service here, John. That, that, that's, that's the ultimate thing is I poke it, but I also want to give something. It's not just poke. Here's, an, here's a solution to your problem. And we, we're doing it right now with what you're doing, first of all, is groundbreaking. I love the orality concept. I never hear anyone really – I hear people talk oral tradition this, oral tradition that. They literally say it as a passing phrase. They never really that's take correct. the time. Now, don't get me wrong. I get probably why. I mean – can they really say what they know is the oral traditions? Maybe not all of it. No. You're trying to take yeah. literary structures and say, we can glean and find evidences. I guess you'd say half a fingerprint in yeah, it that right. tells us there's some dancing, there's some music, there's, yeah, there is right. some orality in this. And they were transitioning. And, and that's, that's right. something I find beautiful with what you do. I mean, it's, um, you know, look, I can't prove that the story of Jacob uh, is a uh, analogized uh, story that derives from the ancient cosmological temple cult. I believe that's what it is, um, but I can't prove it. Uh, but if you, you look, biblical studies treats the oral, that they're now very serious about the oral tradition, right? That's a development in the last 20, 30 years. Yep. <laughs> uh, they're now very serious about it. Having said that, they still treat the oral tradition like it's a literate one. Right. So they go in and they say, well, how did they memorize and how did they repeat the memories and how did they perform the memories? And what I'm saying is, uh, stop. It's not just about memorization of a text. It's not a text at all. It's a completely different epistemology. It's a completely different way to organize knowledge. And it's ritual. It's a myth. It's cosmology. It's sacred space. And it's all organized around your agricultural cycle, what you need to do to live. Right. And so it's a completely different way to conceive of things. And, and, and as a result, large portions of it, uh, we can't reconstitute. I mean, it's lost. So I can't, no one can do it. You said so, it before, and I, I thought it was interesting. God spoke and right. said. Right. And so orality, we go back to that. It's not just that this is a term being used by you. You're suggesting in a literal sense Something oral is what was really the, the, the depths of the deepest you can get in these That's were correct. spoken rituals, not just written. And, and they probably were afraid the same way you would see people, I guess this is a bad analogy, but the way they jot out the name God, they don't even want to speak it. That's correct. That's correct. You know, you got to imagine how sacred some of these teachings were. And Jesus said, I thank you, Father, that you have not revealed these things. So, yeah, I, I used to, as a literalist, go... Why would our Lord ever hide something? From, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't understand what's going on here. So I, I'm seeing there could be something in those passages. Yeah, Just, no, I, I, I agree. <laughs> but um, if you don't mind, you got was Jesus historical? I want to throw something out there because, you know, I love wrestling this topic. And I wanted yeah. to say, you know, it could all be myth and still have history there. There still could be historical characters and the whole thing could be what I call fictional. I don't mean it like completely hocus pocus, but um, meaning it didn't literally historically happen. And there might be stuff that, like you said, mimesis, what we're reading with Dennis R. McDonald that's borrowed from, you know, Homeric Epic or the Bacchae with Dionysus or whatever it might be. I'm looking at this narrative and I see things like, what can we know for about Jesus with certainty. And a lot of people go, he was crucified. Okay. Cause it was a common used tool, obviously for insurrection, the Romans killed Jews often in the first century, utilizing this tool. Jesus is claimed by his followers to have been crucified. He died, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a good case to be made. What gets me in the depths here, and I'm not denying that what gets me in the depths here is how complex the authors must have been to use such mimetic tools in the way they did. They were the, one of the most brilliant writings you can read because they're not only borrowing from, in my opinion, these books of Odysseus and his journeys with the Homeric epics and the Bacchae and all these Greek poetic stories. They're taking from Old Testament 
and they're doing funny things with it, like the will, like the serpent that was lifted in the wilderness. Well, for crying out loud, crucifixions. You know, if you if you were to take the the crucifixion as a lifting up, and and Jesus goes into the wilderness. He, where's the wilderness? Jerusalem, and and it just to me. It's like if there was a guy and he was crucified, as it seems, if you're going to take a historical approach here in any way, they took an idea of lifting one up in the wilderness and were capable of utilizing that into a story where the serpent or the curse, the, I guess, depending on how you want to look at it in the New Testament narrative, I don't know what you would interpret the serpent in the New Testament. That might be the wise one because a serpent was wise. I. I don't know. I'm not an interpreter here that knows this. I'm interested in interpretations, but he's lifted up in the wilderness. And in order to get to the new, the, 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 the land flowing with milk and honey that Israel had to go to, which is the idea the New Testament is giving, you had to pass through and get bit by the snake. In a sense, you have to be through the initiative, the, go through this, this thing, and that would be Jesus Christ. So I see so much of the theology. I see so much myth it's hard for me personally going, this is what he did. I'm a skeptic on if there was a guy who literally was crucified and that that's really what this is based off of. I am open to the mind, the idea that many Jews were crucified. Israel was known to be crucified often by the Romans, Israelites. I mean, did they use that as a template or was there an actual guy? I don't know. You know, like it fascinates me. It's a good question. So <laughs> Hope that kind of gives you something. And that's just one. I mean, there's so many things and layers. It's hard. You know, um, well, look, there's, you know, the old saying, there's the Jesus of history and then there's the Jesus of faith. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the Christian message is a message, uh, in, in my view, that is the moral faith message. Uh, I, you know, I... Derek, I'm three things. I don't shy away from it. I'm a, I'm a scholar. I'm a man of faith. And I'm a pluralist. And a pluralist is, you know, I accept all faiths as long as they do good, right? Um, fundamentalism happens when you stop becoming a pluralist. And it's not just evangelical fundamentalists I'm talking about, right? Um, uh, when when you cut out all the uh, difference from other social, I mean, look look, look what happened uh, to Muslim culture. They they carried science through the Middle Ages until they uh, basically said that our way is the only way, and they stopped being pluralist societies. They stopped taking in Christians and people from other cities and countries and um, they turned into a, um, you know, it's a theocracy, a non-pluralist theocracy, and it, that it destroys, and it destroys every time, and it's not only true for governments, it's true for religions, and it's not only true for religions, it's true for governments and cultures, and so whenever you get a, a subculture that becomes non-pluralist, it starts dumbing itself down, and it never knows that uh, until it destroys itself. And, um, you know, just so, so people understand, we, you know, we, it's easy to make fun of people who take the Bible completely, literally, and historically. I get it. it it's really easy to make fun. And, and I sometimes I just find them, I don't make fun of them. They're just exhausting. I'm like, God, really? <laughs> Can you just step out your front door for five minutes and just look? <laughs> but, but, um, but having said that, uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a structure of religion that does this. It's human nature that does this, right? The secular world does the exact same thing. Sorry, but you walk on some university campuses and they are becoming so non-pluralist. You have to have one ideology and it's, it's actually a little frightening. Uh, some of the corners of our society on the left and the right on the religious and the non-religious wherever uh this kind of fundamentalist non-pluralism occurs it's 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 problematic and dangerous so you know that's just my plug i, can, I um, actually agree with you on that i i i uh that's my plug that um 
when it comes, you know, I'm a Christian and I, uh, I certainly don't take the Bible literally, uh, but I exercise faith in God uh, as, uh, as a way. Technically, you'd way. be very liberal in your approach, though. I mean, you're not yeah. a you're not, and and that's fair. I mean, we've talked about this before. We were talking about the the three days death, burial, resurrection, and, and I talked about could this be a ritual um, instead of a literal thing? And uh, you know, you're like, well, I believe it, but yes, Derek, it could be. And I'm like, wow, someone who's of faith could it even say that tells me the open-mindedness that you have, even though you're not convinced of that, you know, you have your beliefs, right? But that tells me that you're, I respect that. You see what I'm saying? Where I'm coming from is there are people who are damning me. I don't even think your ideology has me or anyone going to technically a burning <laughs> lake of fire type concept. But regardless, I'm not even worried about that because there are people who damn me and curse me and tell me because I don't buy the, I have very good reasons, John, if they were willing to just talk to me, I have very good reasons to say, my friend, I'm reading literature. I'm willing to say it's beautiful literature. I'm willing to say, I'm glad we don't follow a lot of this stuff anymore and that our culture has evolved and we have progressed. And I'm willing to talk these things out with you and tell you why I'm convinced this is another beautiful piece of literature. Teaching wonderful things but not literal in my opinion. They can be taken as lessons and they can have historical uh, root. They could have, you know, there's a variety of things, celestial science, if you will, to some degree. I mean, maybe it's not necessarily, but there could be celestial implications. And the last thing that I'm not convinced of is that a man swallowed by a giant fish that a man really split a Red Sea, that, you know, man made a woman from his rib or God made a woman from God, from Adam's rib. I don't buy that literally and I have good reasons why I think that. And I wouldn't go to, and I'd hope they would follow me on this journey. Let's check out the, let's go check out the Egyptian myth. Actually, let's go check out the Epic of Gilgamesh. How much of your own methodology are you going to utilize? And that's what I love about you, John. You don't go to the Epic of Gilgamesh and paint a different picture as you would. Do you see what I mean? You're open-minded. Even if you follow a certain particular faith, you never push that and you're open-minded to say, I'm looking at the Epic of Gilgamesh like I'm looking at Genesis. I'm looking at these things and going, guys, yeah. literature, beautiful literature, history, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I rabbit trailed, sorry. No, 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 I, I, I'm 100% I'm with you, 100%. I, in my own personal theology, the only people who are damned are the Rosicerians and the French. <laughs> just kidding <laughs> you're terrible <laughs> you're terrible oh man no uh, everyone else is making it to heaven okay. and maybe the rosa syrians <laughs> so, so, <laughs> no i'm just kidding um look i uh you know personally god's a mystery to me uh and that's the that's the that's the that's the joy of the journey is I mean, you know, and there's a different different ways to define God, but um, right. I think a person who um, lives a good and just life knows more about God than anyone else. So uh, you're getting esoteric on me no, there, John. No, I'm not getting esoteric. I'm getting pragmatic. I, I'm just um, saying, I, if I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, that, like I said, there's bad religion in every religion. There are Christians who do Christianity horribly and it creates so much suffering and evil and there are christians who do christianity great and it creates so much good and you know look there are atheists who do atheism horrible and there are atheists who do atheism great this is the pluralist in me i if i don't care what you are i don't care if you're jewish or muslim or hindu or atheist or agnostic i just care that you're just and good and um that you carry a little wisdom with you to apply justice and goodness and if that's what you do, I'm interested in you, and I'm interested in your faith, and I, I want to learn, you know, let's sit down, break bread, learn from each other. That's me, um, and that's always been me. And so that kind of person doesn't stay with a 7,000-year history of the world long, because I'm like, uh, yeah, I've, you know, I'm, I'm now 12 years old, I'm ready to move on. So um, 
I thought we were done poking. I mean, no, <laughs> just get it out, man. No, just kidding. Please continue, sir. I just, uh, to finish up here, boy, we are rabbit trailing all over the place. You're going to have to edit this. I really this, enjoy, you know, I, I think this is, this is me and you heart to heart. Just this is me and you heart to heart, buddy. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. No. And, and that's the best stuff as yes, far sir. as I'm concerned. It's the best stuff. Uh, listen, historicity and literality are not the same thing. Uh, something can be historical and you don't have to interpret the text you have as literal. Okay. Something can be literal and not historical. Now, how's that possible? Well, again, that's very hard for our uh, literate modern minds to, to wrap around. But um, uh, look, 90% of the teachings of Jesus are parables. Is he teaching historical stories? Is the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, a, a editorial from the Washington Post? No. So I was just making the point that point that historicity and literality are, are not necessarily the same thing. You can have history that you don't take literally. You can have you can have a story you can take literally, but not historically. Okay. Right. Um, and 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 the Bible's full of that. And then you've already mentioned this, Derek, showing that narrative elements um, in the New Testament are not modern history does not prove, disprove their historicity. If they're not historical as we define it, that doesn't mean that there isn't historical truth to it. And the other point is showing that narrative elements or structures are mythological does not disprove historicity. That, we've just went over that. Mm -hmm. um, that myth and history intertwine sometimes. There's a little bit of both sometimes in them. And so uh, these are all issues that uh, make, uh, you know, defining a historical Jesus not just straightforward. You know, you have the believers that say everything uh, happened just as the Bible tells me. And you have the, some critics that say it's all mythological and not historical. And uh, both those positions are, are just inaccurate, plain. Um, and then I, I again I'm just my plug inventing a new religion without strong historical roots is deeply unlikely. Um, I there there almost always there's a historical person or event around which an innovation of religion occurs. And when I say almost always, I can't think of an exception. You know, maybe there is, but there's a, re, a historical person or event that occurs around which a new ideology begins to percolate. So every religion you look at in history is is surrounding some something important than ha that happened in history, and um, and so I, I again I'm not a mythicist I I do believe there is a historical Jesus uh, the text we get isn't giving us you know a, a literal historical account um, but um, you know you can make your arguments in the end I can't you know there's, there's just you don't get the sources you want from that era. So you can't prove or disprove a lot of the arguments that are being, uh, being argued. You just can't do it. And I run into this all the time in my work because I deal with ancient mythology where you, you reach the horizon of what you can know really quick. And after that, you start have to speculating and, you know, a scholar, you know, there's sometimes I hate doing that. It's like, I, you know, I just can't say one way or the other, but if I had to guess, it would be this. Right. But I know as soon as I make that statement, there's going to be a dozen other scholars over here who are all sons of bitches who are going to say, no, you can't say this, 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 and they'll try to destroy you. And, you know, that, yeah. you know that, that's what people do. But, um, and so you really want to have a, a firm foundation, but a lot of these issues, you don't get that. Right. right? And so, and so, um, you know, that's just the nature of, that's just the nature of the beast. You know, uh, John, I don't think we need to rabbit trail into anything more. I think we touched on a lot. And yeah. um, first of all, I want to recommend everybody to get the book because <clears throat> your, the perception that you are showing, it, it really does make a lot of sense. Um, it's not too far off from what a lot of the scholars are saying, but you take an interesting route unlike what I hear from other scholars. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, with the orality concepts, we can't think like them. And I think if you really want to have a grasp on what John's saying and a lot of this to really get 
roots in it, I think your book is extremely important to understanding that. And we've had long enough talks that I think I've gathered a lot of what you're saying, but I still need to dig deeper with you. And I think more episodes we can get for people who haven't got the book, who are interested in, in learning more on this. Um, we can go into specific stories. We can go into other things in the future. I don't think, uh, you know, I'm going to keep my research on the historicity of Jesus, of course. I'm also looking for people on the historicity of Buddha. Um, I want to get Buddhist scholars who are not just Buddhist monks, but like scholars and maybe religious in their group. Because Dr. Price told me that there's the same argument going on in the Buddhist no, circles. Absolutely. And absolutely. then Robert Spencer recently, I watched it. You mentioned Muhammad. In, That's in, what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, the Muslim. I'm yeah. trying to find more cool, interesting things like that. Different dynamics. You have friends in the scholarly world. I'd love to interview them. Uh, your work, we're not even, we haven't even, guys, we're on the Titanic and we just left the boatyard, okay? We're not even near the tip of the iceberg. That's that's a, we got well, a long so, ways to so go. This journey ends with everyone dying. Yeah. We're on the Titanic. So, so, that's a good get point. Get a different boat. Get a different boat. <laughs> hey, at least you're not sinking into a lake of fire, okay? So... <laughs> Look, it's all ice, okay? <laughs> you know, I heard Inferno, in Inverno, in uh, in the uh, Latin, is where we got hell, and is actually a freezing place, not a hot place. Someone That's said right. something like that. I was like, what? This is weird. Um, I, I really enjoyed this presentation. I learned a lot. There was a lot there that I've never thought about, and I really enjoyed your parallels to showing interesting things with the Book of the Dead. You said it was called the Book of Life. Yes. To them. To them. We call, why do we call it the Book of the Dead? Because it's buried with the dead. So the uh, you know, archaeologist said, here's a book. It's buried with all the dead. We'll call it Book of the Dead. But it's the book that taught them how to live, right? So it, it, it's literally the book of life for them. Wow. It was a, a way to live. And so... Um, it makes me think of the biblical tree of life, book of life, the, you know, names jotted in the Lamb's book of life, that kind of stuff. I don't know if there's some connection, but yeah, might you be. know what, look, Derek, if, uh, I mean, uh, 10,000 years from now, if Christianity completely disappears and you have some future archaeologists dig up a uh, old Christian church that somehow survives underneath the rubble, right? And he has no text, right? He might have a couple of pages of a Latin mass that he hasn't translated yet. And all he has is a broken altar above which is this guy who's nailed to a cross on the wall, right? How is he going to interpret that religion, right? He, he's going to say, well, these people worshiped a guy that they nailed to a cross and they were a, a death cult, right? Right. <laughs> And so this is how this is how so this is how we do it when we look at these ancient uh, religions such as you know the Egyptian religion. No one really knows what what is really going on because we we don't have the majority of the context was oral, and that's disappeared. And so we like to think that you know we've got a good handle on it. We've got these texts. We got the pyramid text. We got the Book of the Dead. But, I, you know, quite frankly, some of the, the most renowned Egyptologists will admit even the most basic things we do not understand when it comes to that world. And so, um, and, and that's just a fact. So I see a lot of phallus. So when I see that, I start to wonder, you know. And then, of course, you know, you got Horus and then you got Osiris. And Osiris is missing his phallus. Yeah, we'll talk yeah, about this one later, man. There's a that, lot of phallus. Imagery. <laughs> but that goes all over the place, all these different places. Um, John, thank you so much. How can people get a hold of you? Or do you give that information out? No, you know, I, I put out a website, johnlundwall.com. Um, but then a couple months ago it got hacked and I, I haven't, I haven't put it back up yet. So <laughs> that's crazy. And, and, and who's hacking it? Who am I? <laughs> yeah. Like what are they trying to do? I don't understand. I, I have no idea. So here in the next month or two, that'll be back up and you can see uh, all my work. I, my archaeoastronomy work uh, with, uh, you know, Native American rock art. Um, I, ha I have a series called Myth in the Bible on my website that we're just going over things that we've already talked about, such as uh, on this show. Um, you know, I travel the world 
all the pictures on that slideshow tonight I've taken. Um, so all those all those pictures, I, I travel the world to different sacred sites, uh, studying them, learning them, sometimes taking tours with uh, on to them. And so when that gets back up, great. If not, look me up on Facebook, ping me. I'll you know I don't bite. Well, well, I have to look at the comments on this. We'll see how you know. May, maybe you want to invite me back, but are you, you kidding me? <laughs> Anyone who I don't honestly, I don't. That's not how we roll here at Myth Vision. Um, if they're too bad, I'll just silence them. That's you know they won't have any say in the. Oh comments. no, no, don't silence. Them. I, depends. I like reading those. <laughs> yeah, there's certain ones though. Oh, that oh you yeah. Have... Well, yeah, that's true. That's true. There's some that you have to say okay. <laughs> yeah okay look satan shut up no i'm just kidding with you um but no i really appreciate that guys go down in the description you guys see the amazon affiliate link you can get the book there uh, i think it gives us like change on the dollar for purchasing a book through the amazon affiliate link uh or you can go to his website when that is up and running but uh definitely check that out and be on the lookout because we're gonna have him back on the show uh, I want to talk about some of the rock stuff that I think is hidden. It's sec- we, we, somewhere it's lost. Uh, oh, I got a great. Th- there was a recording that we had, yeah. and yeah, giving yeah, no. the, if you made it this far, you deserve to know. So I just want to say, we did a three-hour recording, and uh, John decided to take the hitman off that was going to come after me. But um, <laughs> we we did a three-hour recording, and I had to reboot my computer. I lost all of the recording, and. Um, I was disappointed to even mention it to him. And uh, he actually was kind enough to come back on the show. He talked to God about me not going to hell and stuff like that. We're good. We're good now. So <laughs> Wait, you're not a Rosa Syrian, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then you're good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. No, but seriously, uh, let us know if you want to hear something from him. And if you have any questions, message me. I have direct contact with him. I could try and find out for you, or we could set up a show and do, we'll, we'll try to answer your question particularly. So great. John, you got a great setup there. Really appreciate you joining me again. And, um, any last word? Oh, keep the faith buddy. Right. Whatever that is, do good and, and, and be just, and I uh, love your show. You keep it up. Keep up the good work. Uh, you know, keep it open-minded. I, that's, that's the way I do it. And it seems to be the way you do it. I, I enjoy it. So, um, you know, I, I keep, keep it up. Thank you. Appreciate it. I will do that. And ladies and gentlemen, we are Myth Vision.